think that has been the the most gut-wrenching thing I've ever had to go through. Well, I met my um, my ex-wife at a very young age. We were 13 years old, possibly 14. For a very long time, I, I courted her. I'd say at least four, or five years, probably 17 years old, is when we started our intimate relationship and became exclusively to one another. And I had my first child very young. Um, I was six months from graduating high school. I'm not saying that I did all that great in high school because I literally didn't know where I wanted to go as an adult at that very young age. Um, I dropped out of high school at the age of uh, 17 to make sure I had medical insurance for my, ser for my first son being born. He was a blessing, but a burden at that time. Unfortunately, I had to grow up very, very quickly. So I did what I had to do. Anthony was here, we were born and um, I became a father. As far as being a dad, I was pretty good at that. I had nephews and nieces that I, I looked after and brought up. But I didn't know all the adult circumstances that came with being a father. Mostly financial, mental, took a toll on me. So it had to be three, maybe four months into our relationship as we moved out into our own place. Um, she began being physically abusive, throwing things, yelling at me, putting me down. And for some reason or another. Can we stop there for a second? Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that your phone? It is. Can we put it on silent? Yeah, you want to just grab it? Yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's all right. Should we just start over? Uh, we can take it from after the, uh, the birth of your son and then where it went and then we can go from there. All right. So wherever you're ready. Okay. At the time after he was born, he, why do I feel lost? I'll, I'll bring you back. Um, so, so you had, you had mentioned the, the divorce and sort of reclaiming your life after that. And I had said, tell me about it. And you went back into, to tell me about um, not finishing school because of the birth of your first son. It was a blessing, it was a burden. And then uh, I think you were moving into your next my next phase. Yeah, your next phase. And she was growing up really, having to grow up very much quickly. Faster. After I started working, I literally had $50 left over a week to buy diapers and clothes and gas for the car. All the bills were paid, but it just didn't stretch enough for a family. So then I took another job. I worked longer. I was out of the house longer. I spent every time every waking moment that I had, if I could bring my son to work, I would. I mean, I, I just didn't, I didn't leave the burden to her. But within that, I 
we became distant, she became jealous, she became angry. And she started throwing things at me. She started lying about me. She started breaking things. She broke me. And then uh, we had separated. We had given up the apartment or the condo at the time. And I went my way, she went her way. She moved into her aunt's house. And her aunt was addicted to crack cocaine. And yet my son was five months old at the time. I would get those periodically phone calls late at night. He needs diapers. He needs formula. He needs his needs met. But yet, instead of her saying, you know, you could care for him better than I can, and give him, giving him a better, a better place to be, but that wasn't the case. It was more like a pawn. And after a while, it wasn't really about what I was going through. It was about what he was going through. So I took it. And I, 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 let, I let her dictate what I was going to do with my life. I let her tell me where to be, where to go, who to see, what to eat, how long I could be away from them visiting my own personal family. And after a while, it really became second nature. I didn't mind. I basically said, that's what I have to do, so I'm going to do it. I kind of tried to keep everything into perspective where the way I was raised as a child, I never, I can never remember a day my father or my mother didn't come walk through the door and hug me and tell me they loved me and made sure that I was okay in every way. I had a wonderful childhood. I mean, yes. I was an early baby, so my mother was very protective of me, so playing outside or hanging out with my friends was not an option. But everything else inside the home was awesome. I had absolutely no complaints. That's all I wanted to do for my kids. But I didn't really mesh that very well, considering I looked at the other spectrum, which is the negativity that she grew up in. This was just normal. It was normal to, to yell and scream and fight and argue, pick fights. It was normal. To me, I, I, was, I had already lost before I began because I never saw that. I never did. So as time went on, it slowed down a little bit. The hitting became verbally abusing me. And then, um, which I could take that. I used to block that out a lot. And I always used to make her repeat herself because I really wasn't listening. Everything that came out of her mouth was negative. And then um, after a few years, we had another child, which was very odd because I was happy with the one. And one day I came home from work and she immediately ran downstairs and said to me, we need to have another baby right away, which I found very strange and odd. And I hesitated. I said no. I said no for quite some time. And then I would, well, basically find her on top of me in the middle of the night. And we ended up having another child. So after we had our second child, 
she became depressed. I don't know if it was postpartum or it was something was wrong because she couldn't look me in the face anymore. And I, I didn't understand why. And the hitting started again. And the throwing me out of my own home started again. And it was such a repetitive motion, repetitive motion that I knew within five minutes of me walking through the door, I knew what type of day she had. And I knew what type of night we were gonna have. And I would go throughout my recollections of the past and, and looking into the future, what can I do to change the things that are going on with her in her head so that we could have the family that we want. And it became, I need to take on the rest of the burden. So I put my sons in daycare rather than having her stay at home and watch them. Even though she was home, I put them in daycare. Oddly enough, it was very convenient. It was only two doors down. I made sure when I came home, I cleaned the house, I cooked dinner. I rubbed her feet. I drew her baths. I bought her clothes. I bought her gifts. Anything and everything I could do to make her feel special. To the point where she was just for me. And the more I did that, the more she pushed me away. The more she threw me out of the house, the more she couldn't look at me in my face. And I would leave. And every once in a great while I would get a phone call from her. Can you stop by? I need this, I need that. Again, just a revolving door of the same thing that happened two years ago is now happening two years later after we have another child. It's kind of like she was a child of a product of many divorces where it was normal to have kids and that's it, it's over, we have kids. And me, it was different. Marriage actually meant something. So I never asked her to marry me, even though we had her second child. I didn't think that she would stick around. But she couldn't live her life without me. So again, another place gone. Another start from the beginning. Another, I mean, it was just, from the first time it happened to the second time it happened, I was already in the hole twice. Meaning, I took a big brunt the first time, but the second time, I got so depressed and I was so down that I couldn't even look at the future, I only saw the past. I didn't know if anything was gonna change. I didn't have that butterfly feeling in my stomach anymore. I didn't have that sense of pride of being home with my family. I didn't have, all I did was work. That's it, I drew myself into work. And the more I did that, the more I read, the more times I went back to school. Even though I had all these things that were behind me, I still felt unknowledgeable of life. Like, life. I got up, I went to work. I came home, I went to work. <laughs> it's like, when we started over on the third time, of course, we had another child. And to be honest with you, 
I don't even remember the physical act of having another child because it was so far and in between. I, I mean, I used to see people running out the back door of my house and to save her face or her self, I hid that. Who really looks like the fool? Her for doing it or me for allowing it? After our third, I sat down with her and I had a very, very serious talk. And the talk just consisted of, it isn't about you. It isn't. It's about the, the children that we have. I mean, if you don't want what I have to offer, then please go. Leave them with me. But go. Don't use them as a pawn or a meal ticket. Look at it as you're still in their life. But as I wanted her to, to literally agree with me on this rather than me take her and fight for him. Because let's be honest, she's still the mother of my children. And she's still the mother and she gave birth to them. She has more rights to them than I do, in my heart anyway. But she used them as a pawn, as a meal ticket. After five more years, after all the accusations of me running around with other women, after all the accusations of me lying of where I was or what I was doing, she never understood that. The income coming in and the paycheck reflected where I was. I always did the extra. If I didn't have enough, I always made more. If I spent too much, I always made more. It got to the point where at this time she asked me for my hand in marriage. And I hesitated for a year. Not saying I didn't love her, I just wasn't sure. Again, I couldn't look towards the future, I was thinking about the past. At that point in my life I said, I'm going to take a step back, take it in, and have that aha moment. And I did, I took many, many trips alone to reflect on what exactly happened. And if it really mattered, did it change the way I felt about the situation? And it didn't. It didn't matter to me if she wanted to go out with her girlfriends and have drinks all night. It didn't matter to me if she wanted to go on a weekend trip by herself. It didn't matter to me if she wanted to bring her boyfriend to dinner. It didn't matter. I loved her as a daughter, not as a wife. And my days of dealing with that alone were difficult because nobody knew. Nobody knew. And I kept it all in. And I stayed home every single night with my sons. We baked cookies. We watched movies. 
We did every single thing possible to keep them entertained as a family. But once those lights went down, it was a free-for-all. I got tired of holding her hair over the toilet. Still with the verbal abuse, still with the manipulation, st <laughs> still with the, with the drama. There was never a day where I came home and said, did you have a good day today? And it got to the point of where there was nothing wrong in our household that she would bring other things from outside of the household and made it our problem. So, we were married. We had six years of bliss. She finally stopped hitting me. She finally calmed down. She finally stopped running around. Now mind you, we were young. We were very young. Just like her, I did the same. I did the same from 13 to 15. That was my sowing my, my wild oats. And for her, it was just a little older. But she lived. Never told her where she could go. Never told her where she needed to be. Never told her she couldn't wear what she wanted to wear. I even, I even funded all her little extravaganzas. Whatever made her happy. So that I could possibly be happy. So, six years of wonderful, wonderful marriage. Everything was in perfect order. And I had absolutely no complaints. None whatsoever. The intimacy part, it really didn't matter. I wasn't with her because I, I wanted intimacy. I, I wanted a different type of intimacy from her. I wanted to know her from her soul from the inside of her very depth rather than physically. Just like I, I would come home and if something was bothering me, I would verbalize it. And I would get absolutely no answer. I would be talking to myself. And then after a while, my son, my oldest son, started um, his, first, his first love. And her parents owned a bar and that was it. One night we got an invitation. And like I said, I couldn't keep up with her. And that was it. It all started all over again. Went back to square one. Couldn't look at me in my face anymore. Now the kids are older, now they're seeing this. So what they didn't understand is that what they saw in the year 2013, what they saw from their mother was exactly what happened when they were children. And again, I did the same. I didn't fight. I didn't scream, I didn't yell. First time I was told to leave, I left. I was miserable. It wasn't that I missed her. It wasn't that I cared. I never went one day without hugging my kids. I never went one day without telling them that I loved them. I never went one day without showing them what I have seen in my life as a person growing up in my household with my parents. And I knew they weren't getting that anymore. And I beat myself up over and over and over and over again of the simplicity of me just standing up for myself and saying, those are my kids too. 
and if anybody deserves to continue the love and affection that I showed them, it should have been me. My father gave me a piece of advice a long time ago. Where he told me that I was his only son. And he would tell me that I needed to break the family history. This has happened to all of us. But when I, I left the first time, I was accused of being with someone else and she was having my child. That was the whole reason behind it. But what she didn't understand is neither one of us could have kids, nor my wife, nor I. When my wife couldn't have them anymore, I felt like we're, we're a couple and I'm in this with you. We'll do this together. After the humility that she put me through, just by saying that, everybody turned their back on me. Everyone that always asked me for everything, for everything. And I helped with nothing in return. You didn't owe me a favor. And I went out of my way to help them. They walked away from me after 23 years like I was a nothing. The only person that never talked bad about any of them. The only person that looked at the positive side so that I could get rid of that negative side that they had. And here's the kicker. We divorced in 2013. I took one bag of clothes and one car. When I divorced, I sold her everything we owned for a dollar, and I walked away. Within six months, I'm paying her bills again. Within two months after that, she's knocking at my door. I can't do this without you. I need you. You could tell me how much of a piece of shit I was. I know I overdid it with the drinking. I need you in my life. At that point, I was done. I said, I will help you because you're the mother of my children. I will help you. But that is it. I know you're happy. I know you moved on.
truth be told, I wasn't. I didn't move on. I wasn't happy. I just started growing a backbone. I started focusing on the little things. Enjoying the phone calls from the kids when they needed something. And happy to help when I could provide it for them. And still giving them that positive role model figure that they needed in their life. Even when they disrespected me, even when they called me names, I never not once returned with another fire. I respect you. I love you. I know you're upset. I get it. But I'm here. I am here. And the words that they used, not all the time, but in some points, they hurt more than they actually know. Because I didn't raise them that way. My, one of my biggest mistakes was I said, you could say or do anything you want to me, but don't ever disrespect your mother. She never earned it. And I just gave mine away. At one point in my life, I didn't need, want, nothing. Didn't need nothing. Didn't want nothing. It was those six years that I had of bliss. Six years of bliss. So, she ends up trying to commit suicide in my kitchen. At the same time, she tried to do the same to me in my kitchen. I told her she needed to go to therapy and actually tell the truth. Just let it out. As a matter of fact, just tell me the truth. Maybe you'll be able to look at me in my face again. Just confess. Go to church. Do something. But you need to get that out because it's killing you inside. And with, her, with it, you're killing our family. My boys started acting like her. They started kicking things and throwing things, things I never saw before, just destroying everything they touched. One by one, it went right down the line. I'm thankful that it didn't happen at all three of them at the same time. But one by one, all down the line, I saw the change. And it was very, very quickly on both routes. It went from negative back to positive very quickly. But they had their moment. So after a year of me taking her in and spending time with her, not the kids, just her, at this point, the kids are adults. They're going to do what they want to do when they want to do it. But I remarried her because she asked me to. And I don't know why I did it. Probably because she told me my whole life that I was nothing, that I was no good, that I was a cheater and a liar. And I was ugly.
I was boring. And I looked at myself and I said, yeah, I, I am. I'm getting there. I feel that way. But it was just in, the, in, in, in my ear all the time, just all the time. I became depressed. No, I became to the point where I wasn't suicidal, but I didn't care about myself anymore. I stopped going to the gym, I stopped work running, I stopped my hobbies. I stopped living. I'm in a better place but I stopped living back then. I didn't realize that I put all the blame on her. I, I said, you know, this was, this was her problem and she did this to me. Thinking that's why I couldn't heal. So I stepped back and said, what was my role? What did I do? How were my actions any different than hers? She walked away, I walked away. She wanted to fight, I told her you're right. But I enabled her, I coddled her, coaxed her. I didn't let her suffer. I didn't let her go through hard times. I was always the one that made it okay. No matter what it was, within 30 minutes, whatever problem it was, was solved. Within 30 minutes, sometimes 30 seconds. It didn't, it didn't matter. But I had a lot to do with it. It's not all her fault. And when I took that responsibility and I didn't have to make up excuses for either one of us anymore, I got fed up with myself. So that's what I did. I didn't care. I didn't care if I if I did end up getting hit by a car. I didn't, I didn't look both ways when I crossed the street anymore. I would drive very fast. I would take out my frustrations on myself by not eating, not sleeping right. But when I got to that point where I stopped feeling sorry for myself and started feeling encouragement towards the fact that I did spend the first 20 years of my life one way and then realized I had another 20 to go, maybe even 40, hopefully 60. So I raised my family. I was there suffering, taking the beatings, uh, the scars, the smacks, the put downs, the lies. I took them. And now I realize that what I wanted to do 20 years ago, I could accomplish again. Easily. A 
lot of people don't have any idea what it takes to be a person of depth. And you really, really have to fall on both sides of the spectrum. I've been very, very low, and I've had many, many highs. And either one, I still wasn't happy. So I reflected on everything I've done, everything I wanted to do, and everything I tried to accomplish but never succeeded where I went wrong. That includes my marriage, being a father, and a husband. I worked on myself, but not in a negative way. I didn't, I didn't work on myself to be like, well, last time I was too nice, so now I'm gonna be a dick, or All women are the same. They're not. <laughs> and not all men are the same either. Once they come to realize that there's a difference. Being kind, gentle, and wise doesn't make you a punk doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you any less of a man if you become domesticated. That means you know how to take care of yourself. And whoever walks through that door and wants to spend the rest of their life with you. When you're part of a team, it's a beautiful thing. then you don't have to pick. Someone will pick you once they see you as who you are. They'll always say the same. Someone just like him. Or someone just like her. Once you stop looking at people for what they look like, and take in the fact of how they make you feel, the zen you'll feel at that point surpasses anything that I have ever had in my hands physically that I could say, hey, this is mine. Because now it's no longer in my hands. Hands to my heart. Sometimes I feel as all the things that I have been through, every single time I took a step forward, I took three steps back because I never stopped and looked at what I did. I always blamed everybody else. I always said they did it. But why? Because I allowed it? Because I didn't want to make a fuss over something that was so small and minute that it didn't matter. It just chipped away at my life, one piece at a time. And at the bottom of it all, what was it that broke me? <laughs> Someone didn't, they left the last swallow in the orange juice and put it back in the fridge. It, that would be the last thing that probably broke me. That's how, how minute it was that it just, 
picked away at me and just kept going and going and going. And to the point where I said, enough's enough. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you don't want to see me. I don't care what you think of me. I don't even care if you feel that I am a good person. It doesn't matter. It matters what I feel here. But when you have unconditional love, it's not for a person. When you love everyone unconditionally until they prove themselves different, where you can't help but say, I'm sorry, but I'm not the one that you need. You have to go that way. It's an unconditional love for humanity, for every single living person, thing. How could you not? And that takes us to a whole nother level. Some people like to go into to church or yoga or meditation, which is all fine. Enjoy. I'll join you. That helps you. Helping others that really deserve my help helps me. I don't expect anything in return. I just took everything that I did in my household and spread it out through the world. That's all I did. And I enjoy it. And there's nothing that I could say, hey, that is mine, because I don't want it. I just want to see it. It made a difference. It only takes one. And then there's another. And another. And another. And pretty soon, the good will outweigh the bad. But that's when the bad come and join the good. And when I mean bad, I don't mean like they're bad. They're just... hurting. You know? We all have some form of hurt. Me, I wanted to stay married and watch my grandchildren and rock on the porch and take care of my ex-wife while she was ill and, 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 and live a happy ever life. You know, just live happy. That's all I ever wanted. I wanted to grow old with her. It's too bad she didn't want the same. And I'm very, very finicky at who I will put in her replacement. Very finicky. What's the rush? Like I said, I courted her for four or five years. I got another four or five years in me. Unconditional love. What, what have you discovered about unconditional love towards oneself? When you love yourself within, there is no there's no second guessing. There's no question that you're going to do the right thing for yourself. There's absolutely... There's no better feeling than to wake up in the morning refreshed and say, 
today's going to be a good day. And then you start a little program for yourself. You know, 30 days. You do anything 30 days, it becomes habit. So, for the month of January, no, August, for the month of August was my 30-day revival. I got up every morning and made my bed. Then I removed the towel from the stand. I undressed as I walked through my bedroom to my kitchen. Didn't change a thing. Did exactly the same thing every day. When I got to the bathroom, washed my face, brushed my teeth, looked in the mirror and said, you are good enough to say good morning to yourself. Say good morning to everybody else in the street, but you never say good morning to yourself. Good morning. You look lovely. You're going to get it. Took a shower, got dressed, made myself breakfast. At that point, I used to make breakfast for everybody else, but I never made breakfast for myself. And my TV was my window. I drew the blind. I watched the traffic and the lights. I knew what time it was for me to leave for work by the way the horizon was changing colors. I stopped watching the news. I stopped watching TV altogether. I didn't set an alarm clock. I got up every morning at the same exact time. I did my laundry the same day. I washed my car the same way. I did everything that I needed to do for myself the same for 30 days. Now I do it all with my eyes closed. Every morning I get up chipper. Every morning I say to myself, good morning sexy, I'll see you in the shower. Go to work. Come home from work, travel. I mean, I, I just, I worked on everything that was missing that I, I expected someone else to do for me. That was my partner. That's what I did. And if I felt that morning where I had to smack myself on the ass and say, hey, good looking, I'll see you tomorrow. I did that. It didn't, didn't matter. But I did it for myself. And people started noticing a change in me. My color started to come back. I started gaining a little bit more weight. I started looking more physically better. I didn't fill my space with empty time. I filled it with positive movement. If I seen someone in need, and if I had the means to help them, without a question, I helped them. If I seen trash on the floor outside, I got rubber gloves right in the side pocket of my car. We all live here. There you go. So I chose to lead by example. If more people see me doing weird little quirky stuff that needs to get done, perhaps they'll do it too. I even noticed that I noticed a change in my neighborhood. You know, the kids used to be outside hanging around and they would be across the street and down the street and they would throw their wrappers and their And when they saw me picking it up, they were like, "You work here?" I said, "No, I don't work here. I'm just picking up the trash." But I didn't yell at them. Why are you always throwing trash? They looked at me like, wow, you go out of your way to do that? Now they pick up after themselves. 
And if they need help picking up after themselves, I help them. So I help. My, what worked for me was I did everything I needed to do for 30 days. I paid more attention to myself. It wasn't like I was being selfish. I was being selfless. So, everything that I wanted someone to do for me, I did it for me. What did you learn about yourself through this process? I learned that I'm pretty, I'm pretty much amazing. <laughs> That's what I learned. I learned that I have the patience of a saint. I have the strength of a bull. I have people in my life that care, and not because they have to. But I have, I have come a long way from where I was to where I am. And I love it. I really do. I love it. And there are days where you think to yourself, is this ever going to end? There's that fear of, if I don't continue this, is it going to end? Am I not going to feel like this forever again? Do I enjoy it now? Because this is my six year break. And I say no. Why would I ever stop loving myself? Do you have a favorite quote or mantra, song lyric, or piece of advice that someone's offered you that resonates with you that you'd like to share? There's so many. There are so many. But I would probably say do it to others as they do to you. The complete opposite. That's exactly what it means to me. Yeah. I would give you the shirt off my back, but not expect it in return. That's a definite. So do unto others as they would do to you is more like a reflection in the mirror as I was speaking of this. You're telling yourself. So you're actually telling yourself. It's kind of deep. You got to like really think into that. You got to turn it around. It's got to go the opposite direction. But I don't think I've, I don't think that I would, um, be in the new place that I am if I didn't look into myself. I stopped worrying about what everybody else thought. 
I didn't stop doing that. If I didn't look at what I did. The first person I forgave was everybody else, but I never forgave myself. I didn't forgive myself. And I have. I'm at that point. I have forgiven myself, along with everybody else. And I just didn't do it. I earned it. I worked at it. I definitely worked at it. How has it felt to talk about these experiences and feelings with you today? Liberating. liberating. I have so many things that I had buried but in the last five months I removed. I can't remember everything that happened to me anymore. Before I used to be But now it's like little pieces of my life are being replaced with the positive pieces of my life. But in, and in tune, they're now disappearing from my memory bank where I can make space for new memories, for good ones, for bad ones, for ones that hurt and for ones that make you happy, but new was a different mindset and a different type of outlook on life that really makes me feel wonderful. Do you think that it's possible by sharing your story here today that you could potentially inspire and bring someone else some hope to continue to move forward? journey and make some new memories for themselves. Hmm. You know, if there's anything that you're going to take off of this, off of my story, off of me, The most important thing that you have to do is look at yourself. If you're going to be a judge on anything, lead by example. Judge yourself. Don't ever feel like you don't have to do something because someone else isn't doing it. Every single person in this world, at one point in time, no matter how much money they have, no matter how smart they are, no matter how many times they have fallen, they need to love themselves. And that's not being greedy. And that's not being needy. It's being real. You can't ever love anybody unconditionally till you unconditionally love yourself. When you say, hey man, I love you. But when you turn around and you put judgment on that, You have to look back into yourself again. Just keep doing it. Just keep looking into yourself. There's going to be so many things that you're going to pick away one thing at a time.
but with old age comes wisdom. Even if you sit and reflect every 10 minutes with your eyes closed in your office, in your car, for some people, in the alley. None of that is okay. And it's time to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Some powerful stuff. Feeling. I'm all right. Yeah. I'm getting old. <laughs> You're getting better. <laughs>